Hi everyone. So this is the first time I do a workshop, and today's topic is about decoding decoding brain representations and decoding. Why this workshop? As I mentioned in my abstract, in cognitive neuroscience, the MVP method has been used because it has the ability to provide richer information than the univariate univariance uh, variate analysis. So for today's workshop, what do you want to learn? Should I just give an introduction or review or introduce some key papers or toolbox? I think that's not what you want. You want this <laughs> the hands-on tutorial, right? Yes. Okay. So the goals of today's workshop, three things. The first thing is I want to let you know what's the method to decode Brain representations. And second thing is to let you understand why and when to use this method to decode brain representations. And third thing is to let you learn how to do brain decoding using this method. I think the third one is the most important one you want to learn today. So the key goal is to let everyone can do it using minimal code. Okay, so we can start it. Here's an outline of today's workshop. I will introduce one toolbox, two methods, three coding examples. And for the toolbox, I will introduce a toolbox called URA to do the representational analysis. And for the two methods, I will focus on classification-based decoding and representational similarity analysis. So for the classification-based decoding, I will first do a very brief intro introduction and using two examples. And in that two examples, Let's do the code together. And if you have any question about code, just ask questions to me and I will answer them. And I hope for that two examples, we can do the work together to get the final results based on some demo data. And also I will introduce some advanced extensions of the classification based decoding. And for the, the second method, RSA, I will also give you a very brief introduction and I will use a third example about RSA. And we will also do the coding together to import the data and do the RSA together to get final results. And I will also introduce some extensions of RSA. And um, here, all the examples today are based on easy data because the easy data is, is easy to run for, for a workshop because for FMI, then we need to spend a lot of time to run the result. But for today, I want you all get the final result. So I just use the easy data here. But I hope after this workshop, you can generalize all the knowledge to um, to extend to the FMI. Okay, great. So the first part, let, let me introduce some about the classification-based decoding. This is very popular or famous example of the classification-based decoding. So if we ask subject to view two kinds of images, one is the bottle images and the other one is the shoe images, and we can measure the brain signals from fMRI. So we can use the voxels as different features. And for each Im images, we can get a vector including different voxel activations. And for the task, we will do a lot of trails and in, in each round, it has many trails. So we can select two rounds to train a classifier uh, and do the task based on that trained classifier. And for example, here on the right bottom, you can see in the feature space, um, the blue dot corresponds to the new activation of the shoes and the green dots corresponds to the new representation corresponds to the bottle. And if and here, if we can find a boundary to um, classify these two kinds of neural distributions, that may suggest that our brain has two specific representations for the bottle and for the shoe. And if the dot is random in this visual space, that may suggest that our brain is encoding nothing, it's not encoding the bottle or shoe. And for easy, um, here's a, another example. If we have the data for when the subject view, we would first take imaging for both images. And on the left, we can we can get the data um, from the easy data from time time ta. And the 
blue squares corresponds to the neural representation of the birthday cake trails, and the green squares corresponds to the blood trails. And you can find we can find a boundary to classify these two kinds of um, neural representations. And if for time b the square is random in this feature space, we cannot find a boundary to classify these two. So on the left, we can get a higher classification efficacy, and on the right, the classification efficacy will be very low. So this suggests that the representational differences between birthday cake and both were more strong and strongly encoded as PA. Right. Okay. So in this example, we can do the time by time decoding. So that means we can conduct independent classification for each subject and each trail and each time point using a linear classifier. For example, here, for each trail, we have the easy signal like this. So it's a matrix with the shape of the number of channels by the number of time point. So the data we have is the EG data. The shape is a very large matrix. The number of subjects by the number of trails by the number of channels by the number of time points. And we also have the label there. So for each trail, we have a label corresponds to birthday cake or the boat. So we can set zero as the birthday cake and set one as the boat. And what we should do is to classify birthday cake versus boat for each subject and each time point. And here we use the channel as the features. So if we have 10 channels, that means at that time point, we have 10 features for each trail. And we also need to do the cross validation for each step because we don't want our classifier model to be overfit. So, um, for example, if we have um, 100 trails and we can do uh, fivefold on cross validation, that means we divided our 100 trails to five folds and we use four folds to train that classifier and pass on the left one um, fold. Okay. So what we want is the decoding result for each subject. We can get a time a time curve of the decoding accuracy. So the final output should be a matrix with the shape of number of subjects by number of time points. Any question here? Uh, how much of the processing should be done for the easy data people use? Oh, okay, that's a good point. So sometimes we can just do the filter filtering and. Uh, use ICA to re re exclude the uh, eye movement in fact. And then we get the ERT signal for each trail. That's enough. So this is a very standard um, data format. So for each subject and for each trail, we have the number of channels by number of time point metrics. Okay. So here is like a framework. So we have if we have this kind of data, we have the EG data with this format, and we have the label data for each trail. And what we want to do is to do the classification for each time point for each subject, and also including if some you know, algorithms like we use the channels as the features and do cross validation. And the final goal is to get the decoding accuracy with the matrix, the, the subjects by and time points. Then, the final results should like this. So if we have 10 subjects, we can get 10 curves and we take all the subjects results together to show this curve. So this curve, the arrow bar is the SEM of the decoding accuracy for each time point. Okay, so this is an example for easy decoding. And today our goal is to do this. Let's import the data and let's get this kind of result. So here we're going to do, we're going to select which time point is the putting accuracy uh, best. Um, I'm just wondering what to be on like today, but could you also, instead of time points, see like which channel is decoding actually? Uh, you can do that, yes. So because here the channels is, are the features, so you can also get the weights of different features mm -hmm. for each time point. And you can get a hot map for the channels. So you can see which channels uh, has a more important role in decoding. Okay. So how to do it based on Python? So today I will introduce a toolbox called the new RA, and you will find a lot of very easy to use functions in this toolbox. Okay, 
So let's go to the first exam. Let's do the decoding image representations. Let's go to this website. Uh, you can search my GitHub ID, the Zigong Lu, 1996. You go to my GitHub website and find the project called CCBBI Decoding Workshop. You will find it. Okay. And you can see around the course, press the button below and press this button. And we will go to a collab website. It has a lot of codes, and we will run that code. And I will explain what the code means. Uh, everyone here? But if you have any question, cannot go to this page, just let me know. Oh, also for the chat, I can I can send you the link in chat. Everyone here? Okay, I suppose you are all here. Okay, so for the first part, we need to install some packages and import some functions from different packages. So just press the wrong button here. Let's start it and run anyway. It may take some time to download some packages, like the zip file or new array. Should I be worried if I got errors about could not find a version that satisfies the required zip file? Uh, you can just ignore that, thank you. Okay. Okay, we download all the packages and import all the functions we need today. Then the second part, uh, this part I write for download the demo data to use today. So you can just press run here. And uh, I have already write all the codes for importing the demo data. If you want to learn how to download data from uh, the place I showed all the data, so you can just check the course here, but I will not introduce in detail for this part today. Okay. So after you run this part, uh, we will get course we will use today. So you can see the last four lines. The last four lines, you can see there are four variables. The first one is data one. The data one is we will use for our example one. And the labels one is also we will use for our example one. And the data two and the labels two we will use for our example two and three. So we can just ignore the data two and labels two here. We will just use the data one and labels one. Okay, so if everyone gets the data, let's start the example one. The example one, we will do the classification-based decoding to decode image representations based on our demo data one. So first we can check the data. We can press, we can print the shape of data one. So. That's wrong, this part. So you can see the shape of data Y is 10 by 160 and by 7, 17 by 100. So what does 10 means here? The 10 corresponds to the number of subjects and the 160 means the number of trails and the 17 means the number of channels and 100 means the number of time points. And in this experiment, the I just show you an example that the, the subjects view two kinds of images. And the time is from minus 0.2 seconds to 0.8 seconds. And the sample frequency is 100 hertz. Okay. Any question about the data structure here? We can also print the data like this. So you can see the data is responds to the EEG amplitude also the EG signals. And the labels here, you can see just zero and one. So the zero corresponds to a basketball image and one corresponds to the cat images. So what we want to do today is to do the decoding between basketball and cat, okay? Great. 
So our goal is to input the brain signals, the 10 by 160 by 17 by 100. That's our data we have. And the output is the decoding accuracy. We want to get a matrix of 10 subjects by 100 time points. So how to do it? We need to do that for each subject and do that for each time point and do the two class classification use, using linear classifier and also do the cross validation. So this part is very hard to do that step by step, but today I will introduce the easiest way to do the decoding here. So I will introduce a ready-made function called time by time decoding K4. So you can use the health function to see what's the input and what's the output of this function. So run the help of this function, you can see the help information of this function. So there are some very important input parameters. Like the first one is the data. The data is, is the neural signals. So the shape should be number of subjects by number of trails, by number of channels, by number of time points. That's what we have already have, right? Okay, and the labels should be number of subjects by number of trails. And you can see here for the shape of labels, 10 by 100, that's the number of subjects by number of time points. So we have already have And there's some other parameters like the N. The N is the number of categories for classification. And here we want to classify the cat versus the basketball. So we have two categories. So set N as the two. And an average. So this part is very important for EG because the EG signal is very bad for each trail. So sometimes before we do the decoding, we need to average on some trails to get a better signal in signals. So here um, we default the default parameter we set it to five. That means we average every five trails to do the decoding. So for here we have 160 trails. So if we are average every five trails, we will finally got 32, 32, 32 samples for each uh, for to do the decoding. Okay. And there are some other parameters, but we can ignore that part. So here. And, um, for the activity class by trials, is that typically done in fMRI data too? Or there uh, you can also do that for fMRI data. But for fMRI data, sometimes we don't have enough trails. Yeah. For EEG, we have 160 trails, but for fMRI, sometimes for each condition, we only have 20 to 30 trails. Yeah. So we don't do that okay. normally, but if you have a lot of trails, you can do that. Okay. It can, it's a trade-off because if we average the trails, we will get less samples. So less samples will lead to maybe cannot get a better classifier. Yeah. But if we get more samples, maybe we can improve that. But more samples, the signal is not as good as the less sample. These averages, it really requires stimulation to the same or just the same. Yes, right, oh. right. Yeah. So for example, here uh, we have 160 trails. So eight trails for the cat and eight trails for the basketball. So the averaging happens for each condition, for each cat. But they don't need to be the same image. And for this example, they use the same image. Oh, same image. Yeah. For this example, they just view two images. Okay. Another question. Are any of these parameters that you would normally optimize by like using part of your data to like, like are any of these hyperparameters that I should like optimize before running it on like my test data? Um, I don't think so. You can just use the default parameters okay. here and you don't need to change anything. So in this function, um, I already add a linear SVM and you can just run this mm -hmm. function and it will do the coding for each time. And um, when, would you, when would you switch normalization to true instead of false? Uh, the, the K4? No, the normalization, it's like not a parameter we're using, it's just false. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Um, this is also a very tricky thing. So some papers, they do the coding before they normalize all. It's signals, but for some other papers, they didn't do that. Sometimes it can improve your um, decoding performance, but sometimes it, it's hard to say. So it's just a parameters you can choose to use, but I think it's not necessary. 
So I didn't uh, introduce this part. Would it matter with your stimuli? Like, what if instead of seeing the same, what are we looking at? Boats? Basketball. Okay. Basketball. Instead of having like the same image of a basketball, if you view different images, then would you want to normalize or would that not matter? I, I think it doesn't matter. It depends on your question. So uh, if you want to do the decoding between animates or inanimates, you can you can have the trails from different images, but that image can all from the animal images. Yeah. Yeah, and you can ignore the image differences, but they are all from the same category here, the animate uh, images. So you can ignore that and just input that to the trails to view the two class classification. Is it also maybe like because it's within subject? Like if we were doing between subjects, is that when you would want? Oh, that can. Yeah. So for this part for decoding, we 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 hardly view any across subject because, mm -hmm. yeah, because we have a lot of individual differences. Yeah. So for here, for my introduction today, all the examples are based on mm -hmm. individual things. So we have this function and we have the data. So our input data should be data one and labels one. And we can set different parameters. So because we do the two class classification, so n should be two. And we average every five trails for each condition. And time window here means we do the classification based on each time point. And so we want to do that for each time point. So we set the time window as one. So we can do that for each time point. And the time step, also the same thing. So we, we finish this time step, we will do the next time time point for the next in the independent uh, decoding step. And for the, I just set three here because, and the number of repeats, that means we will run three times three fold cross validation. Okay, so these two parameters Combined together means we can do three times three fold classification. And the question here, you can also set it to four or to five. Uh, but today I just set three here. I just have a quick question. See, not one for me to human theory is trying to um, make the results more valid. Yes, more right. More false. They randomly split the data so we can, can we control it? Like, in R, we put a theme, so every time we can produce a theme, it's a bit of data. Uh, actually, in this function, we for each time point, we randomly choose a theme. Oh. So every time will be different from both to, to divide it, to divide all the data. What about averaging the five trials? Are they mostly? I also randomly choose, yeah. I shuffle the order of, of all the trails, and I select the first five together, and the next five together, like that. But it doesn't even split across categories, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. The time window is each like right. uh, the time window here. So for example, we have 11, uh, 100 time points. So if you set time window one, that means we do the classification for each time point. So we will do 100 time uh, classification. But if you sign the time, if you set time window as five, we will combine the first five time window together. And then do the next five time windows. Then it, finally, we have just got a um, 20 time window result. Why do you say combine time window? You mean take uh, just average that? And um, if you want to know more details, uh, so for example, just another parameter here uh, called the time option. So if you set the average, that means just average that time window. And if you set to be features, that means we will use the time windows time point by the channels as the features. But that will cause, that will result a lot um, more features. So I don't think it's a very good way. You have a lot of trails, you can do that. But normally we just average the signals in that time window. And for this example, I didn't average any time windows here. So the time window just set one and time steps as one. Okay. So we can run this function to get the decoding accuracy. And let's see what the final result will be like. Everyone can run this function, run, run the course of this one. It may take some time. So.
because we have 10 subject skills. Any question you can ask while I run this post? And if anyone cannot run the code, just let me know. The average across time window, but there are a few tiles in the different labels. Uh, what do you mean? Um, so what, what you said, um, average across the time a window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, with the same label? Yes. Okay. So for each trail, I just average the different time windows. So for each trail, if we have 100 time points and I average each five time windows, we will get 20 time points at the end. So for, for each trail, if we have 100 time points, so we have 100 um, data and we average every five. So finally we have got 20 time points, right? 100 time points. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we got the accuracy here. So we can check the shape of the accuracy. So the shape is 10 by 100. So that corresponds to 10 subjects by 100 time points. And that's what we want. So in our goal, you can see, check our goal. So our goal here is to get the output of decoding accuracy. The shape should be 10 by 100. So that's what we want. You can also check. Sorry. You can also print the accuracy here. So each value corresponds to a specific decoding accuracy. Okay. Then we want to plot our results. So we want to show that curve to to others to show our final result. And here I also introduce the easiest way to plot the decoding accuracy result. So the function names the plot time by time decoding accuracy. So you can run the help functions here to check the input of these functions. So I just introduced some import, important parameters here. The first thing is the accuracy. So we get the results. So we can import that result to this function to plot. So the shape also be the number of subjects by number of time points. And we also need to give the this function, the start time and the end time and the time interval. The time interval corresponds to, for each time point, corresponds to how long, how long the time window that is. So for this example, um, the time frequency is 100 hertz. So for each time point, the time interval corresponds to 0 0.1 and um, 0 0.01 seconds, right? Okay. Sorry. And the chance, the chance is the chance level for classification. Here we do the two class classification. So the chance level should be 0.5. That's the random decoding accuracy, which we will solve. And the p-value is at 0.5, 0 0.05. Okay. So for here, we can copy that functions. And uh, so we set the start time from the minus 0.2 and the end time the 0.8 and the time interval should be 0 0.01, and the chance level is 0 0.5 and p-value. And also uh, some other parameters, the test time, that means which time window we want to do the statistical task. And we said, we also set the color of the curve of the result, and we said the X range and Y range. The X range is the time, and Y range corresponds to the decoding accuracy here. So we can plot the results. So you can see here, and that's the decoding accuracy we want to get. So, so here you can see we just use one line to input our data and the labels, and we get the results. And use another line to plot our result. And for here we cannot see the decoding accuracy higher than 0.8. So we can set the y limit to be a large here range. So I can also set it to from the 0.4 to 1, and the result will be more clear. That's clearly. Uh, okay. 
And here you can see, this is the decoding efforts for each time point to decode the image representation. And some other people may ask, uh, for this kind of results, sometimes we will do the uh, cluster-based computation test to see whether this time window is significant or not, because this time window is not as long as this time window. So for the function of the plot time by time decoding accuracy, we also have a parameter called CBPT. That's the class-based class permutation test. If you set it to be true, it will do the classification cluster-based permutation test to pass every significant time window are real significant or not. So you can also run this part and it will do the permutation for each cluster. So this part will take longer time it will get more strong as the test result. Any question about this plot function? It's cool that the significant time windows also come out just like as text at the top. Yes, right. So first we do the t-test for each time point. Then we want to test whether the each significant time window are real significant or not. So we use a uh, cluster-based computation test to test with every cluster is significant. No, I just mean the way you wrote it so that it outputs and like writes that for you at the top of the graph, like okay. in the school. Okay. <laughs> and it's cool too, but like. And we can see here after we, even we run the cluster-based um, computation test, this time window is still significant. So we can say it's true. Our brain is encoding the image differences at this time window. So that's all for the example one. Any questions here? So can you remind me of the stimuli presentation time of the interval between the trial? From zero to stimuli onset. Yes, the zero is stimuli onset. And I think the stimuli just show for 200 milliseconds. The next trial starts at. Oh God. <laughs> okay, it's just an example. <laughs> so today we will not focus on the specific scientific question. I just want to do a hands-on tutorial to let you know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> so here I don't want to mention uh, which kind of data set I use for guess. <laughs> okay, and you can see also see the output of this function. The output of this function corresponds to the significance for each time we know. So the output here is it's a vector with mm, including 100 values. And if the value is one, that corresponds to this time point, the uh, accuracy is significant. Would you have to normally like correct for multiple comparisons when microporting something like this? Um, so here I just do the cluster based computation. Cluster based, you don't need to. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's the first example. That's back to our slides. So in example one, we did a two-class classification to decode the brain representations of two images. So based on this thought, we can have some interesting experimental designs. For example, if you want to investigate size representations, what kind, what kind of design we should do? So maybe we can set small and large objects and the last objects to see these two two types of images. And then we can do the classif we can classify small versus large, right? And we can get the significant results to see how our brain is encoding the size. And also if we want to investigate depth representations, we can set this kind of design. We set front and back objects and we do the classification for front versus back. So anyone want to um, answer this question? If you want to investigate facial expression representations, what kind of design we should do if you want to do the decoding? Happy versa. Yeah, great. Yeah, we can set base images with different expressions and we do the classification like the happy versus neutral versus sad versus angry. Similarly, if you want to investigate, investigate color representations, we can set the squares with different colors, right, <laughs> William? 
Yeah. You're familiar with that. Yeah. And we can do the classification by the red versus yellow versus green. So sometimes there are more than two classes. If we want to investigate orientation representation, there's a study. They ask subjects to memorize this stimulized orientation. And after delay, they do the response to, um, to rotate the mouse, to rotate this stimuli to the orientation they memorized before. And they set 16 different orientations, like the zero degree, the 22.5 degree, the 45 degree to um, 300, 37.5 degree. So they have 16 different orientations. So if you want to answer the question, um, the time, the dynamics of our orientation representation, what we should do. So we should do the same steps to decode, to classify 16 different orientations. The only difference between two class and 16 class decoding is the chance level are different. For two class decoding, the chance level is 0.5 and the 16 class decoding, the chance level should be 6.25%. Any question here? Does it have to be, to be discrete? Can, can you ask the model to give a pre prediction? Uh, and that's not a decoding model. Yes, you can do a regression model to answer that. Okay, so let's go to the second example. In the second example, we just want to get results to see the dynamics of orientation representation. And the task is like this. The subject see a stimuli with the specific orientation. And after delay, they do the response. And in this example, this experimental design, they set 16 different orientations. So we will do 16 class classification based on the EG data. So let's go to the second example. Let's decode orientation representation. Let's go back to the CoLab website and for the example two. Um, that's the data queue and labels queue we may use. First, we can check the data here. So you can see the shape of data queue um, is five by 640 by 27 by 500. So this corresponds to five subjects, um, 640 numbers of trails, and 20, 27 channels, and 500 time points. So here, the time window is from minus 0.5 seconds to 1.5 seconds, and sample frequency is um, 250 hertz. Any question here for the data? And we also have the labels for each trail. We can plot the data here. So each value corresponds to the EEG signals. And we can also print the labels to here. So the labels to here, you can find the label for each, each trail. And we have five subjects by um, 640 trails. The value here from zero to 15 corresponds to six, 16 orientations. So the zero corresponds to zero degree, the one corresponds to 22.5 degree, and the 15 corresponds to 337.5 degree. Any question here? Okay, so for this example, we want to decode representations to see how our brain is encoding the orientation. So the goal is to input our brain signals. The shape is five by 640 by 27 by 500. And we want to get the output of the decoding accuracy that's a matrix with the shape of five by 500 time points. And to save the time here, I want to down sample the data if we average every five time points. So the sample frequency will change to be 50 hertz, right? And so the input should be five by 640 by 27 by so here should change to be 100. Okay, and we use the same function. So the function here is still, we will use the time by time decoding k fold and we input the data two and 
level two. And because we do the 16 class classification, so the N should be 16. And we do the down sampling, so the time window should be five here because we average every five time points. And the time step also be five. And here we also do three times three both cross validation. Any question here? I think it's very similar to your last example. So time, if you make time steps less than time window, would that mean they will overlap? Yes. Yeah. If you set time steps as one, that means, um, for example, the first time window, I will use the first five time points. And the second time window, I just remove one step. Mm -hmm. So I will use from the second time point to the sixth time point as the second time window. Does the number of tries for each label has to be the same? Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah, because in in this in this example, um, for each condition, they have the same number of trails. But for some real um, examples, you may not have the same trails for each condition. But that doesn't matter. So in the time by time decoding k-fold function. And they will random choose the minimal number of the trails for each condition and to match, they random choose to match and do the decoding for each then for each step. I'm kind of following on. So if one of my conditions has a lot, a lot less trials. For example, uh, for example, for zero degree, I only have 30 trails, but for 22.5 degree, I have 50 trails. What, what the function will do is just random choose 30 trails from that 50 trails for that step and do the decoding. Then, but because we will do the cross validation and we will repeat it many times. So for each time, they will random choose. So it, it, it is a very random step. So, but the, the, goal, the goal is to match the number of trails for each condition. And the function will do that automatically. So you don't need to worry about that. So if I have an imbalanced case, I will lose power because it's- um, Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So we can run this code and we can get the decoding emphasis here. So I'm just wondering which classification are we going to use to handle the power? Um, here we use um, one versus all. Okay. And how do you judge whether it's good or not? Um, that's hard to say. Yeah. So for I mean, for each label, you will have some kind of classification accuracy. So you average. Yes, we just average all of them. Right. So that's one. Tricky things for multi class classification. Yeah, sometimes for one, sometimes there's just two classes, you can get a very strong uh, classification result. But that can lead to a higher or significant decoding accuracy than just level four, three or four class classification. Yeah, that's one very tricky thing, but um, we can just ignore that part today. So for here, we have 16 different orientations and we do the 16 class classification and we can run the course here. Okay, the decoding finished. And we can check our result. The shape of the accuracy is five by 100. This suggests um, we got the five subjects decoding accuracy for each time point and time points we have already download the time frequency. So we only have 100 time points here. And we can check the decoding emphasis here. Each value corresponds to the decoding accuracy. And we can plot the results. So, so for here, um, the time window is from minus 0.5 to 1.5. So we set start time and end time like this. And the time interval, because the time frequency is 50 hertz, so the time interval is 0 0.02. And the chance level is 0 0.0625. That's one sitting. And we can plot our results. So you can see the result is like this. And we can find the significant time windows here. 
it suggests that in that time window, we are encoding the orientation information. Okay, we can also rescue the y axis. So we set y limb from a smaller range, and the results will be clear. Okay, we can also do the class, uh, cluster based permutation test to test whether this time window is significant, but I'm sure it's significant here. So you can run the code here and it will do the cluster based permutation test to see whether that time window is significant. And after we got this, this result, we can make the conclusion that our brain is encoding the orientation information from this time window. So because there's a lot of steps where like it randomly selects stuff for like your cross validation and stuff. So like my results look a little different than yours. Yes, of course. Can I set the speed so that that doesn't so happen for me? What you can do is set the n repeats a very large value. Okay. Yeah. That will give you a very stable result. Yeah. Good question. On the figures, the the width is that standard error or standard deviation? Uh, it's the SEM. Yeah. I don't want to make the error bar so long. Okay, that's the second example. Any question here? I can back to slides. Okay, I just introduced some basic classification decoding examples. And I also want to introduce several extensions of classification based decoding. The first extension is the cross temporal decoding. For example, in this study, they trained classifier based on a certain time window and test it on different other time windows. So you can generalize a time by time matrix. And the value here, for example, the value here, that corresponds to, I use the data from 0.4 seconds to train the classifier for example here. And I test it at the 0.2 seconds. So we can do that for different, um, different, every two different time windows to get the cross temporal decoding result. Another extension is we can also do the cross task decoding. For example, in this study, the last subject uh, do a perception task for an immigrant task. So you can do the cross task decoding. I trained the classifier based on one task data and test that on another test data. So the in this example, the input should be two tasks data. So I input the data from test one and also input the data from test two. And I also input the labels from test one and the labels from test two. And we can get this kind of um, cross task decoding result. And you can find the functions corresponds to these extensions in your way, but I will not introduce that today. Then we can go to the second part, the representational similarity analysis. So the representational similarity analysis, RSA, um, is a very brief introduction here. For example, if you are, if you will, um, three different stimuli here. The first two is are uh, social images and the text, third one is the uh, non-social images. And we can get the brain signals corresponds to these three stimulus. And we can calculate the this similarity using one minus correlation between the R1 and R2 to get the values here. So we have three conditions, so we can get three by three metrics and each value corresponds to the representational dissimilarity between two conditions. And that's what we can calculate for a newer RDM. The RDM means the representational dissimilarity matrix. And we can also create a concept model, or we also call it hypothesis-based model. So we base on our hypothesis, we want to see whether that region is encoding the social information. So our hypothesis, if the two stimuli are all from the social um, conditions, the neural representation will be the same. And if the two stimuli, one is from the social images, one is from the non-social images, the representation will be very dissimilar. So based on this assumption, we can make the matrix here. So from the same condition, we set the value as zero. And from 
if the two conditions are different, we set the value as one. And we can calculate the correlation between this new RDM and the hypothesis based model RDM. And you can see it's very uh, similar to each other. This may suggest that this ROI is encoding the social information. So for our say, there are three steps. The first one is we need to make our hypothesis based RDM and we need to make our new RDMs. Then we do the comparison between that hypothesis based RDM and our new RDMs. Another example, that's the most famous one. So in this example, they asked human and monkeys to view 92 different images. And the, the first half of the images are the animate images. And the last, the second half of the images is the inanimate images. And if you want to see whether the IT is encoding the animate or inanimate information, we can make the hypothesis based RDM. So if the two conditions are both animate information, animate images, we set it as zero. And if the both inanimate images, we set it as zero. And if the two conditions are different, one is from animal images and the other one is from inanimate images, we set the dissimilarity as one. And we can use this matrix to do the comparison with the new IT RDMs. And you can see these two metrics is very similar to each other. We can see two class clusters here. So this may suggest that the IT is encoding the animal and in animal information. So based on this stuff, for EEG, we can also make the hypothesis based RDM for our research question. And we can also calculate the RDM for each time point based on our EEG data. So the framework is like this. So in our, based on the design, if we have many conditions, we can make our hypothesis based RDM, the shape should be number of conditions by number of conditions. And we can also make our new RDMs. So we have number of subjects by number of time points. And for each time points, we make the RDM. So the final shape should be a matrix with the number of subjects by number of time points by number of conditions by number of conditions. And we can do the comparison between these two. So we do the comparison for each time point. So for each time point, we compare the left RDM with the right RDM. So finally, we will get the similarity for each time point. And we have number and subjects. So finally, what we want is number of subjects by number of time point of the representational similarity here. So based on this framework, how to do it based on Python, we can also use the new RA. And we can use the same example here. So in this example, they are subject to memorize different orientations and they set 16 conditions. To investigate orientation representations, the method one, will, what we have already done is to decode 16 orientations. But for method two, how about making a hypothesis-based orientation RDM then compare with the EG RDM? So what kind of hypothesis we should make for the orientation representation? Here's the example. We have 16 orientations. That means we have 16 conditions. So the shape of RDM should be 16 by 16. And we can make a hypothesis-based orientation RDM like this. So in this assumption, we make if the two orientations the degrees are closer to each other, the representation will be more similar to each other. So the dissimilarity will be a very low value. And if the two degrees are very far from each other, for example, the zero degree and the, the 180 degree, we will set a very large dissimilarity index. So based on this hypothesis, we can make this kind of RDM. And also we can make the RDM for each time point for each subject. And for each time point, we will also get the 16 by 16 RDM and we can compare this two. Any question here? Okay, so based on this framework, let's go to the third example. We will use the RSA to decode orientation representations. So let's back to the CoLab website. And what we want to do is just three steps. We make the orientation RDM and we make 
each RDM for each subject for each time point, and we compare them. So the data are the same. Uh, we have the data two and the label skew. So this part, I just directly show you how to make that um, orientation RDM. So, so the assumption is the closer the two orientations are, the higher the similarities. And you can use the plot RDM and import the orientation RDMs here to get the results. So the model RDM, the hypothesis-based orientation RDM is look like this. Then the second step we want to do is to make our easy RDM. So for each RDM, we want to calculate the similarity between each two conditions, and we have 16 conditions. And currently, the shape we got is 5 by 640 by 27 by 50 uh, by 500. And we want to have the shape is like this. So for each condition, we have six conditions, and each condition has 40 trails. So we want to reshape our data into this kind of format. So this part of the course is to reshape the current 640 trails into four trails for each conditions of the 16 conditions. And after I do this, the data two 16 conditions shape will be like the 16 by five by four 40 trails by 27 channels by 500. Any question here? Okay, so we have this input and what we want to get is the output of the RDM for each time point for each subject. Okay, we can just use a very simple function called EGRDM. You can see the health function here. And what you need to do is just input the EEG data here. The shape should be condition, subject, trails, channels, and times and it will give you the final results. So you just input your new format of the data two and set different parameters. So I will introduce the parameter here, the subject option. If it's set, set to one, that means we will calculate the RDM for each subject. If you set it to zero, you will get the averaging result. And the channel, if it's set to one, that means we will calculate the RDM for each channel, but for here, we just calculate for each time point. And the time window, we also set it to one and um, to five and time step as five to down sampling the time. Okay, we can run this and it may take one minute. Any question here? So if the channel function is one time operation is low, uh, it doesn't matter, you can set it one or zero. If you set it to one, the final result will not be five by 100 by 16 by 16. It will be five by 100 by 27 by 16 by 16. So because you will calculate that for each time, each channel. Then the similarity is calculated just based on two. Based on the distance, yeah, based on the differences between the amplitudes. So the reason you have named the function EGR here is it? You yeah, it's have it. Yes. So in your RA, there's also a function called FMI RDM. So you just need to input the a large matrix of the FMI signals, and you can get the RDM for each voxel for each subject. Have we already? And up to this point, discarded the redundant half the data. Uh, what do you mean? Since we only only half of the matrix is, it's like it's mirrored, right? Yes. Do we already? And, half? Oh, so this part we calculate the whole matrix, and when you do the comparison, That's you just easy. choose the values above the diagonal yeah. to calculate the singularity. Another question? It, I think this is the last part. I've already run all the time. Sorry. I have one question. So basically, you can test the same hypothesis using both the decoding main and all the RSM. Yes. And you will see the result will be very similar to each other. But which one do you think is more sensitive? Oh, that's a good question. 
So sometimes, um, sometimes the EEG signal is not as good as fMRI. So if you just do the correlation kind of thing, the results will not be as strong as the decoding. Because for correlation, if you have some outliers, it will cause the R value very large or very different. But for decoding, um, it will be less sensitivity to some, some outlier. Okay. So we can check the EGRDM's shape. The shape is by subject by 100 time points and by RDM. And we can check you know, here. So you can see the diagonal is zero. This corresponds to, because the diagonal corresponds to the same condition. So the dissimilarity should be zero. They are the same. Okay, then we can do the comparison between the orientation RDM and the EG RDMs. And we use the function called RDM story. So in this function, you just need to input a demo RDM and your EG RDMs, and it will get the final result. So for here, just input the orientation RDM and the EG RDM you got and run it. Okay, very fast. And we can plot, print the shape of this result. So it's five, five subjects by 100 time points by two. So the two here responds to a T value, a, a R value and a P value, because for the correlation, you will have two output values. But here we just need to use the R value. So I just ex extract the first, the, t, the R value here. So the similarity here, you can print it's like this. So we have each subject for each time points, the similarity between our hypothesis based orientation RDM and the EG RDMs. And we can plot our results. So plot results, we also have a ready-made function called plot time by time similarity with that. So what you need is just to input your similarities and set some different parameters like what we have already with. So you can set the start time, end time, time interval and p-value to plot the results. And the result is like this. So it's very similar to the decoding result. The time window is very close to that one. And we can also rescale the y-axis. So we make the y-range smaller. So it's like this. And we can also set the cost-based permutation test to be true and to test whether it's significant here. The last two slides. There's also some extensions. So, but I will not mention today. If you want, maybe I can do that for next time. Okay. So the first extension is the FMI EG fusion. So we can calculate the EG RDM and the FMI RDM and to compare between them to see how different regions are encoding that specific information on the time window. And another example is we can compare between brains and artificial neural networks. So for example, we can input the same image to the human and to the models, and we can get an act um, activation from the models and from the brain. So for each, we can calculate the RDM for each time point. And for the models, we can get the RDM for each layers, and we can compare them. So we can also get a time course of for different parts of the model with the brains. Yeah. And that's all. And I will finally introduce my battle box. <laughs> so it has a large of modules. So you can do you can just input the data and you, it can calculate like the intersubject correlation, the spatial temporal pattern similarity and RSA and decoding. And you can do some stats based on the toolbox and also plot the results, even for FEG and, and for FMR. And thanks for coming. And here are a lot of information you can find from different websites. Thanks. Mr. Tom.